things I want you to know, maybe three, possibly four. <laughs> it's important for us to grow. You know, you can be in the church for a long time and have arrested development. And I think this year the Lord has helped me a little bit. I've told you, every week the Lord provides incredible opportunities. Sometimes he brings people who become part of my message, unbeknownst to me. Now, you've heard me say this enough. There'll be a few people here for the first time or listening for the first time. They'll be in shock when I say, <clears throat> brace yourself. Jesus was not born December 25th. Now, I don't want to spoil the party of those people who came in today who are complete strangers or heathen or your guests, but I want you to listen long enough to understand something. Every single year, or almost every year, I've devoted this time to proving something about the date, related to the date. One year I took you through the courses of the priest, if you remember in Luke's Gospel, to show you that if a person wants to really look and find the evidence for it not being December 25th, the Bible has information. Most people, including most religious institutions, don't want to do that. That's rocking the boat. That would be terrible. Now, I want you to know, I want to put this out first, and then I'll come back to what I'm saying in a second. I'm not really interested today in the date. I'm more interested in you being able to tell other people, and if you're listening to me for the first time or you're relatively new here, being able to tell people what Christmas should be about. And don't, don't go, oh, well, we know the etymology of the word comes straight out of heathenism. We're not talking about the Christ portion, but Christ must. I don't want to discuss that. I don't want to talk about the date. As I said, if someone wants to go into Luke's gospel and see the courses of the priests and see that Zacharias, who is the father of John the Baptist, was working the course of the priest. His course was the course of Abijah, and you can go straight back into the Old Testament, trace exactly what month that would have been in service because they kept, and the Jews were very perpetual, you know, they kept rigid, strict guidelines to things. Even if there was a change in the priesthood, they, ch they kept the courses as close to what the initial perspective was about. And therefore, we can know that after he served his course, Zacharias, that is, he went home, he knew Elizabeth in the biblical way, they produced John the Baptist, and six months later, Christ was born. Now, if you do the math, you're going to end up with some birth time being sometime in the fall, September, October, depending on the year that the Feast of Tabernacles and Trumpets occurred, depending on that in that particular year, because although it is, we give the equivalent of our English September, October, you've got to go to the Hebrew months. And by the way, just as a sidebar, although it's not my message, we know we have a fixed date for something. But if there is a fixed date, I ask you this, indulge me for this, if there's a fixed date for the birth of Christ, why can there not be a fixed date for Passover or for Easter. Now, you know, ask anybody to give you an, a logical explanation for certain things, and they just can't. So I, I really don't want to try and argue about the date. I've said many times that if you're really wanting to search for the evidence, you can go into this book and you can find it. And we're not talking about one passage of Scripture. We're talking about abundant proof. We're talking about, and I'll mention this, God's set times, that God has set specific what the King James refers to as festivals, but they are set times of God. And just as the Apostle Paul writing in the New Testament said, Christ our Passover, understanding that these set times of God represented something beyond their initial presentation. They were a shadow of something the type fulfilled in Christ. So when people talk about Christmas, and I, I say this with all due respect, I was sitting with somebody who was very dear to me this week, and 
she and I sat and had a discussion. And I asked her what, because she was talking about her Christmas tree, and I asked what, it, what, what Christmas meant to her. I was curious to know, could somebody who's never listened to me give me an idea of what this thing means? And she said, well, it means love. It means, it means love. It means, I don't know. And I went, wow, it's a good holiday. But the fact of the matter is, if one really understands what, what the Christmas message, regardless, whatever time of year Christ was born, that's what I want to put aside this particular time. For the benefit of people who haven't had the years of listening to straight Bible-based, not Melissa Scott, not Jean Scott, straight out of the book, for the benefit of some of you who have relatives who today have either gone to Mass or have said, I don't really care about this day, for the benefit of some of our Jewish friends who are celebrating a true holiday in Hanukkah, which is actually a certified, actually happened, it's a great celebration to really understand what it is we are doing when we talk about these things that are so obviously celebrated. Now, here's the big problem that I have. Don't think for a minute that someone like the Pope doesn't know what this day is and is not. That's not to condemn the Pope. That's the mindset that has permeated the institution of the Church and of Christendom for now these well over... 2,000 years. That is, let's not rock the boat, lest anybody should come to know the truth. Then you pierce a hole and you have people saying, well, what else is not true? What else has been fabricated? Now, I had to go back. I've got a volume of uh, church fathers. And some of you who've been around, who have your own little library at home, go out. Or don't go out and buy the church fathers, please. It'll be bored as... If you want to know what hell, a foretaste of hell is like, <laughs> read the church post and uh, Antinician fathers. It's a real, oh boy. But I had to comb the volumes of those books to come up with the following, and I'll read you what I came up with. There were no birth celebrations mentioned by Arrhenius, who lived about 130 to 200, or Tertullian, who lived at 160 to 225, an origin of Alexandria, who lived in 165 to 264, goes so far as to mock Roman celebrations of birth anniversaries as pagan. These are historical records. So if somebody wants to go back and look, around 200 AD, Clement of Alexandria makes reference to the date of Christ's birth. However, he never mentions December 25th. By the 4th century, the West... The Western Church, not, we're not talking about America, we're talking about East and West as we know them. The Western Church has chosen December 25th, the Eastern Church, January 6th. This is why you'll hear about the Greek Orthodox and the Armenian churches celebrating Christmas January 6th. And the 12 days in between are known as the 12 days of Christmas. They are not the 12 gifts. Never mind. This crazy stuff, you know, you ask somebody, what does it mean? Oh, it's the 12 days of Christmas. I don't know, it's the 12 days that came before or after or during or I don't know. The earliest mention recorded of December 25th is from a mid-4th century Roman almanac that lists the dates of various martyrs and bishops. In 400 AD, Augustine of Hippo mentions a local dissident group called the Donatists who kept December 25th but refused January 6th. By then, the day of Epiphany was already being celebrated as Epiphany. They, they said that was fabricated. So they chose one and said it's authentic. The other one, they said, is fabricated. Now, I'm going to jump over hundreds, if not now, thousands of years, or at least a hundred, a few hundred, to show you even our understanding of Christmas in America is skewed. The pilgrims came here in 1620. Man, I just jumped over a couple hundred years, right? At least 1,200 of them. They are here fleeing from religious persecution, the right to worship freely. We just celebrated Thanksgiving, and everybody seems to have an attachment to the idea that when they landed that first year, they celebrated and gave thanks, which they did not. They almost all died. And it took a while for Thanksgiving to become what we know it as today. 
But if you go back in our history, Christmas was not a holiday celebrated in early America. In fact, and please check this out for some of you that are just kicking your heels right now and grinding your teeth. From 1659 to 1681, the celebration of Christmas was outlawed in Boston. And there's a good reason if you understand what was going on back then after the American Revolution, English customs fell out of favor, and so, by the way, did the celebration of Christmas. We're talking about America, folks. <gasps> right? Okay. Yeah, I like this one. This is my fun factoid that would make every bureaucrat fall over. Congress was in session December 25th, 1789. They were in session. They were actually working. <laughs> <laughs> The first Christmas under the U.S. Constitution, and they were at work. That is a miracle. <laughs> Christmas was not declared a federal holiday until June 26, 1870. Now put that in your pipe and smoke it. I get really, I get really aggravated to hear people Dr. Scott used to say this all the time, but now I see it more so than ever, who are experts in religion, yet they cannot for any reason at any time with great intelligence or eloquence or Bible defend what exactly it is they are standing up for. Don't give me an argument of what you feel. Oh, I want you to have feeling and have emotion, but that must come after you've understood what exactly it is you are placing your whole entire life into. Who and what? Now, if you talk about the history of America, it's kind of funny. When you talk about the North and the South, that was greatly divided. The South was first to say, we will celebrate Christmas. Louisiana was, uh, Alabama was first, then Louisiana, then Arkansas. After that, the North followed. So, you know, when we talk about the history of things celebrated, I could talk to you about the history of the Christmas tree. And no, I really don't want to tell you about how phallic a symbol it is. Uh, that will really make some of you who have actually put up a tree because you like the way it smells be very upset. So let's just, I'm just, that's, this is all introduction to say, I don't want anybody here listening to think that I am dispelling with the birth of Christ. But let me say parenthetically something very important, especially for new people here. This message will probably have little value to you if you have not settled the most important thing about the faith we call the Christian faith, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which usually we play a message every week, and every Easter there is a message being presented here on the proof, some realm, some evidence, some something to give you factual, something to hold on to, to say, this is my faith. Settle that, and once that is settled, you come back to these things such as the miracle of the virgin birth, and you realize that God had a great plan. You know, settle this first thing first, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then come back and talk to me, because everything else is energized by that one fact. Now, I'm talking from experience. I came into the church, like most of you, with traditions and some really bad ones, too. Thinking, by the way, that although I've told you this before, thinking... I knew who God was, or I believed in God, but that's about it. And boy, did I find it over the years. Now, of course, I will spend the rest of my life learning about this one and combing his book, but I realized the ignorance of my proclamation back then to say that I knew, or I believe there was a God, but what on earth does that mean for some failure creature some sin-stained life. What does that mean? I know there's a God. And then you come back to this, as I said, the resurrection, the starting point, which is not my message today. That's an Easter message. But if you've settled the resurrection, you come back to see why Christ came. And you must go into John's gospel to get this 
very clear. So go with me. This is some very basic stuff, but I'm doing this for the benefit of many people who have come into the church and have never had it explained to them. Why is this so important? John's gospel opens with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was reading King James right now, with God, and the word was God. And there's a definite article missing in there, by the way. If I were to, for those of you who don't want to see me write Greek, (laughs) too bad. Uh, (laughs) See how loving I am today? It's It's my Christmas wish for all of you to understand how important this language that God used before the New Testament was being written in the ancient writers in the Greek realm that God was using this language and words within this language that represented something else that John, under divine inspiration, reaches down and grabs hold of in his writing. And we have in, and I'm adding the, I won't write out the whole thing, but I wanted to point out this word, the logos. In the beginning... We have the Logos, was the Logos. And the Logos, the word, the Logos, we have here was with, there should be a definite article there, was with the God and the word was God, of the same essence. And right here in the opening of John's Gospel, you have probably the most important fact stated about Christ of the same essence as God, Theos, of the same essence, of the same nature, but we're not, we're not homogenizing. In fact, John has some very complicated theology. We get our word theology from the word God, Theos. Some very complicated theology reduced down for us in one syllable, practical English. And what's so remarkable about this is that what he's saying is from the beginning, the opening of Genesis, from the beginning, from before the worlds were even formed. Now, in the ancient Greek culture, the logos was understood as a go-between, an intermediary between the theos, the God who was unknowable. And I love the way John just pulls this all together and tells us that the Logos, the Word, could tell us all we needed to know about what in ancient culture they thought as Theos, the unknowable. Now, the the Jews did the same thing. The Hebrews did the same thing with the word that we use for Yahweh, Jehovah, in putting the vowels underneath it to read Adonai, or sometimes in their their, um, Chaldean manuscripts, instead of it saying Lord, they say Yahya, instead of writing out the name of Jehovah, because they thought it was too holy, it was not to be uttered. In fact, the the direct opposite of what God said, he wanted to be known, he wanted to reveal himself to them, his oracle people, and instead they covered up the name, which is why when I went through and taught Hebrew, I made sure to break people of that habit, because in learning Hebrew, I have some people here who learn Hebrew, hold up your hand. How many, when you started, you wanted to, we did open reading here, and they'd come up and they'd read, and even though I told you not to read the vowels underneath, you'd still read it, right? Eh. That's what the scholars did to make it so that you wouldn't pronounce the name of God. When God said to Moses, when he asked, who should I say sent me? He said, I am, and we are essentially, when we say the name Jehovah, we're saying, I, we're saying, we're ex- we are proclaiming the, the name of I am as he revealed himself to us through his word, through his oracle people. And John makes this really clear. When you think about this, you see how God intruded into our time from eternity, clothing himself. Later on it says he, he was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's John 1.14 to show us, to reveal to us what exactly and who exactly God was. Now, when you think about the Christmas 
story. And you think about every church pretty much that has a nativity scene. Most people are looking at the nativity scene and saying, this child that was born in Bethlehem, they're looking at this through natural eyes, even though the virgin birth is a miracle, through natural eyes, a child is born, and people just get all crazy about that because there's nothing more beautiful than seeing a small child, but you miss the whole meaning of in the beginning was the Logos, the one who could tell us all about the unknowable one came in flesh, into that bundle of flesh called Jesus of Nazareth to tell us, to reveal to us, to show us. And when we think about how people celebrate Christmas, this is why I said to you, be very careful about navigating the subject. And as I said, so many experts in this field, uh, all you've got to do is log on to the Internet and read somebody's blog they have a post, hashtag Dunscap. I don't know, I just made that up. <laughs> of their expertise, which is rather remarkable because most of these people haven't spent any amount of time, or if they have, they've got some interesting listening device. They hear information, they sift it to what they want it to sound like, and then they put it back out there in their own skewed way. Now, I'm telling you something. God Let's stop right here with in the beginning was the Logos. And that Logos spoke, basic foundation stuff. That Logos spoke the worlds into being. That Logos that John is speaking about, out of nothing, everything. That same Logos is peppered through this book revealing now, you know, you can jump all the way into the New Testament and you can read what the writer of Hebrews says, that God at different times in different ways spoke to the fathers through the prophets. And now in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Put an exclamation mark there. Yes, there is no other revelation. There are religions out there that say they have other revelations after the fact. I tell you, just stick with this book. And what it says, and you won't go too far astray. Now, for the people who are willing to accept this doctrine, and it's the oldest doctrine, which is the most confusing doctrine of the whole entire realm of Christianity, of the Trinity, to explain that they're the three part of the Godhead, and one portion, if you will, of the Godhead came to earth, when the Greek says, and the word, the logos, was made flesh and dwelt among us, tented, tented in flesh, just like us. But before that tenting occurred, you read through the Old Testament, you'll find Christophanies, you'll find revelations of that logos. So to just merely stop at what is called the creche or the nativity scene is saying, I'm only interested in this one event and it's not one event. It can never be one event because God was unfolding his drama to redeem a people from Adam's first going astray, and I say Adam generically, Adam and Eve, using a man, not a Jew, not a Christian, not a Muslim, a heathen man who could hear the voice of God named Abram, calling him out of Ur of Chaldees, Beginning with him, I jump over the types of Noah, and I jump over many others, but I go straight to him as God gave him the promise, which I've been referring to for these last few weeks in different messages in different places, of a seed, of a son. Giving for the first time a picture, a clear picture not that there weren't other clear pictures in the, in the garden, which many people like to talk about Adam and Eve and their expulsion from the garden, but before then, they clothed themselves in fig leaves. God killed an animal, the first shedding of blood by God to demonstrate that man could not cover up his own shortcomings, that God needed to provide a covering. But in Abram is the first time we see God essentially saying, I will be the Logos to you. I will be I will give you a promise, Logos, and I will be the Logos to you. I will reveal myself this way, speaking to him directly. 
whether you want to say he was in a dream at one point, but at other times spoken to directly. And from that speaking voice to the revelation given to Moses of the law, which so many people like to talk about as being preeminently a Jewish thing, but rather the law was given to Moses, not the Ten Commandments, although the Ten Commandments are clearly what was given. Again, another oracle, another way of giving the logos to the people to show man's impossibility of approaching God without the prescribed sacrifices. I was sitting with somebody months ago, and they said, they're, and they're a Christian, by the way, they're a Baptist, and they're forgiven for that. Uh, <laughs> But I was sitting with them, and they said, tell me why God, I still don't get why God had to use all these animals and sacrifice all these animals. And I, I sat there, and I thought to myself, now this is a person who professes to know the Bible. And I, I thought, okay, well, let me do it this way. God gave the law, and he said, thou shall not, and thou shall not, and thou shall not, knowing man could not. But he also gave a way of approach, which were, the sacrifices. You go to the book of Leviticus and read how God lays out the sacrifices. And he says, this is the way of approach. You want to come to me? This is the way you're going to do it, which requires the shedding of blood. And you can say that's gory and that's terrible, but that's the way God did it back then. He said, this is the way you're going to approach me. This is the prescription for your malady. Take the medicine, do as I say, or stay in your condition and die now, we come to the New Testament, it says, for sin comes death. In the Old Testament, there was only one way. It was God's way or no way. The individual said to me, why so much shedding of blood? And I said, this is the way God did it. And even there in the shedding of blood, he's talking about something that if you are not willing to study the types, watch exactly how God lays out his whole plan of redemption, and even there, he's saying, it's almost like saying, this is a shadow of the logos that will come, that will be to you a sacrifice for trespass and a sacrifice for sin and will be a peace offering and will be all the offerings that are required eventually will be fulfilled in the logos. Right now, I speak the logos to you, and this is what you must do, but eventually there will be a perfect fulfillment of that in one named Jesus of Nazareth. So when people talk about Christmas, I, I'm asking those of you who have not taken the time to understand in the beginning was the word, and that oracle word, that word given, that word, by the way, I just referenced the Ten Commandments. There are more than more than 10 things that comprise the law, 306 do's and don'ts, but in the Ten Commandments, broken in the hands of man, given a second time, and placed inside the ark to prove unequivocally, by the way, that man could never keep the law. It was not designed for man to keep and to show that only through God's prescription could mankind be healed. And there was not yet a concept we talk about reconciliation and coming back to God. There was not yet revealed to man a way to completely cleanse the mind and the heart. One could follow the prescription, but to be completely set free. I think I'm clear in arguing this. That's not until the coming of Christ, and it's not until the Apostle Paul unfolds it all, and the writer of Hebrews declares it, the blood of bulls and goats could never cleanse the conscience, could never cleanse the mind. All it could do is give for that set time the individual the ability to keep walking with God. It could not fix the internal, and it certainly could not restore the broken connection. Only for that set time in that period, as good as it was for that time it was offered. If you didn't offer tomorrow's offering, or the set time offering, you fell out of favor once more. In other words, it wasn't a once and for all. So when we talk about Christmas, I'm really praying that those who are listening understand the logos that was in the beginning, through the oracle people, even through the flaws and the failures and the mistakes 
was entering in to correct, to teach, to, to show people the way. And if you really think about it, if we were to just end the, the canon as it does for the, the Hebrew reader, which ends with Malachi, you end up with a very sketchy picture, a prophecy in the third chapter of Malachi foretelling about the coming of John the Baptist who will go before Christ and the close of the fourth chapter which ends with a curse. And if that's all that you had as a people and that's all you had to hang on to, you wouldn't have very much. Just a sketch of a prophecy. And let's just add on to that, a sketch of a prophecy with nothing yet fulfilled. There'd be no hope. So when we talk about this, you know, Christmas should be something... Please don't think Christ, Master. Think about what we're talking about. Whatever time Christ was born should be a celebration of something. should be a celebration of what exactly God deigned to do on the day that he decided, and it wasn't some random, oh, I think I'll come to earth today as a baby. This is why the genealogies of both Matthew and Luke are so vitally important. Matthew specifically because he goes back, Luke will give you, and they both trace the lineages to show you how far back in the tree God was looking back to the generations at a perfect intersection in time to bring about the prophecies of a virgin who would bring forth a child who now would be Emmanuel, God, or the with us God. So don't go all Christmas tree on me, and I don't want you to go home and throw your Christmas tree out either. Understand, you know, there'll be people out there going with the javelin. We saw a guy like that one time in New York. Remember him with the Christmas tree on the sidewalk? He was like a javelin, tossing it down in the icy streets of New York. Mind you, I think he was a little high, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's okay. What I'm saying to you is the importance of understanding reaching behind the event to something that God had planned before the councils of heaven. When we talk about, and I've quoted many times in the book of Ecclesiastes, God has placed eternity in their hearts. I want you to think about the eternal one, which I've referenced in John's opening as the theos, the unknowable. God made it so that we could understand about this eternity he's placed in our hearts. Imagine having something in your heart and you're not able to understand or explain it, but here... The Logos reveals it to us in spite of ourselves. This is why I love reading this book. It gives me something to say. God has been working through the failures of man. And if you really think about it, when people talk about 400 years, and there was not 400 years of silence, but the intertestamental period for which the celebration I mentioned of Hanukkah occurs in that time frame, you realize that God was still, the Logos was still operating. The Logos was still preparing and unfolding and getting ready to enter in. And when we talk about this condescension, which Paul picks up in Philippians and says that this one that dared, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, put on the flesh, condescended himself, taking on what is our likeness, yet knew no sin, Think about that and you really come to the reality of what this celebration should be. Now, I had to really kind of settle this in my mind because there are several ways to go down this pathway, but the best one to explain this is from John's perspective, something that was uttered from the beginning, from this beginning of time into an intersection of time, that is, the Word was made flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, to understand that before this event occurred, God unfolded the drama of exactly what was required to bring man back to God in a book of the Old Testament which never even mentions God at all, the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is all about the kinsman redeemer. Now, one year I did that. I did the whole message of Christmas, I think, was from the book of Ruth. But that book is so brilliant. You know, the more you read the Bible, the richer and the deeper it gets. That book is so brilliant. Because I remember 
probably in one of the earlier messages I preached and said, of course, Ruth lost her inheritance, and the only way the redemption could come was through Boaz. Someone had to redeem a lost inheritance. And then I began really reflecting on this. Of course, we all have a lost inheritance. The book of Ruth is not only a love story, a great love story, and the story of the kinsman redeemer, but it's the story of every single creature, person, born on the face of the planet in the shape of Adam, lost inheritance. And I thought to myself, of course, this is exactly the reason why Christ kinned himself to us in the flesh, unfolded in that book to tell us there were certain requirements that needed to be met in order to redeem us. Now, I don't, listen, if your salvation isn't real to you and all of this is just another day in the chapter of your life, then friend, don't waste your time here. But if you understand something, it is the oldest doctrine of the church, and people have fought over this, whether a baby is born and it is born innocent and good and becomes bad, or whether there is something innate, in, and I've told you this, it's as simple as saying, even though you look at a child and the beautiful face of, of a baby, that little cherubic smile and those little cute little eyelashes looking at you, and if you don't if you're not careful and you're changing the diaper, you might even have more to be smiling about. <laughs> but that cute little baby couldn't possibly have any evil thoughts. Those must be learned. That's what people, some people say. I've said to you, in Adam, whether we like to admit this or not, the whole blueprint of humanity was plunged into his sinning likeness, forevermore created in that fallen image, even a beautiful, innocent baby. Now, settle that. And you might say, well, I don't like that doctrine. I don't like that way of thinking. Well, it's kind of like this. It's hard for us to accept certain things. And I was just reading this morning something that seems rather banal, but it'll give you an idea. How many of you know that you see things backwards and upside down? Now, some of you are raising your hand, but come on, you're in God's house. But... but you see things backwards and upside down. Your brain has the ability to correct it all, make it right side. It's almost like a mirror, an upside down mirror. And your brain has the ability to flip it the right way. And that's how you see everything. So right now, you guys are actually on the ceiling. <laughs> what I'm saying is that's a hard, if you don't understand what I've just said and you have no um, neurological or Let's just say you have no understanding of the way the human body works. That you're going to say, oh, no way, that's impossible. I see everything the right way, right? And you probably think like that too all the time. But if you understand, so that'll hit you later. But if you understand what I just said, as hard as that is to accept, it is a true principle. As hard as it is to accept about humankind and human nature, which is why I love what Paul writes in Romans. I've quoted this to you. Many, many times, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means don't come into a church. Somebody comes into the church and they start condemning you for something you've done or something you do. Run out the door. Why? Because the condition of humanity, this is why in God's offerings, two offerings, one trespass offering, one sin offering, one offering for the sins that you could you, you knew about, one was for the sins of ignorance. You could say, things I know I've done versus the things I don't know I'm aware that I'm doing or my condition in total. I'm a sinner. Do you know why I, do you know why I stay here? I should have, I'm telling you something, with all the stuff that I've been through, I should have been gone a long time ago. Lots of my en enemies would have liked that. I stay here because I know I'm preaching God's word, and if I only help one person who's just like me, who's lived out in the world, been through the mud and back, had experiences that would scare the hair off the back of a camel. How's that? <laughs> to be careful about my words here. If it's just to help one person make it in, I'm fine with that. Because I know, yeah. I know that I lost my inheritance. I didn't lose it. 
out there in the world. I wasn't even a prodigal. I realized I lost my inheritance that really I was born and never had it and had to get old enough to know the only way to get back what God brought me to have was through understanding the kinsman redeemer, paying the price, being who he was, the logos of eternity, and doing what only he could do. Now, I, I go back. I'm all over the map. I'm trying to stay focused, but I'm, I just want to say this so it, it has something that can penetrate, and you can leave here saying, I got this out of what she said today. In your own time, even if you're not a Bible-reading person, if you don't have a Bible, you can go on the Internet, and there's King James Bible there, NIV, whatever Bible version you will read. Please, I get tired with these people saying, that's not the right version, that's not the right version. It's English. Please don't get me started. But in your own time, read that book of Ruth. It's very short and kind of sad and beautiful. And it paints a picture of what exactly this Christ child should mean to a world that's so engrossed in its celebrations and its traditions that make void the word of God. It paints the picture of you and of I who have lost an inheritance. And without this one, represented by Boaz in the type of the book of Ruth, who was not only able to, had the means was willing to of his own volition. That means Christ, when he said, I lay down my life, no man taketh my life, I lay it down of myself. When you begin to look at this book and look at yourself, as I look at myself, I never preach to you and say, hey, I'm looking down at you. Look at myself, I take it to heart. I think to myself, this message, too bad the world doesn't understand what, whatever time of year Christ was born, I just said to you, Look to the fall, September, October. This should be the meaning and message of that birth celebration. Not so much that a child was born, but that God took on this tent of human flesh, making it possible, kinned with us in the flesh, making it possible for lost inheritance to be gained back again by one and only one who could. This is why when people argue about the law, I just, oh, I go crazy. I was having a conversation just the other day with someone about the law. And I'll tell you about the law. Paul says, the law was good. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ until faith has come. And in Christ's own words, he doesn't say, standing before the disciples and the Pharisees and all the experts, he doesn't say, you know, and they said, well, what about, what about murder? He doesn't say this for the benefit of people who think they may be able to keep the law. He took the law, and I've told you many times, he raised the bar. He said, you've heard it said, thou shall not kill, but behold, I say unto you, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murderer. I don't care what your standard of goodness is. Settle that today, especially for new people. Don't come in here and say, I'm good because you're goodness, and let's take the best person we can think of, and I say best in terms of caricature, the Pope. And let's stand you and the Pope side by side, or any other person you want that you deem as good in your eyes, or let's take a tall person, pick the tallest man or tallest woman, and stand beside them. Is that your measuring stick? But you're still going to be chasms apart, million mi millions of miles away from the sun, the distance of both of your heads from the sun. So forget about that as a measuring instrument, and by the way, if you're going to measure your goodness, you equally have to measure when somebody says, I'm basically a good person. Let's measure out the other side of that. We'll not talk about the things you say you don't do, but let's talk about the things that you haven't done. And we'll talk about the law in reverse, the things that you haven't done that you were supposed to do. How about that? That's why Christ said the law is not going to pass away, not one jot or tittle, but he embody the law. When he came in the flesh, he walked the streets and the law essentially fulfilled in him. He was that perfect representation of exactly what his name, the word, the logos bears. A depiction of perfection that no man or woman, not me, not you, can ever reach. Hence the reason for the message of the kinsman redeemer. 
Now you realize this. Christ could have come, let's put aside for, for a moment, the virgin birth and the birth of a child. And a man, God-man, could have appeared, just appeared like that. Imagine, let's rewrite Christianity for just 50 seconds. And instead of a child being born in the most humble setting, in the most poor depiction, a man could have appeared. And a man could have appeared and walked the face of the earth, man and God, and took on flesh and dwelt among us. And the only thing that would have been missing in the equation, which we would still be talking about, is where did this man come from and how did he come into being? Which is why I bring you back to this Christmas story and say to you, for those people who want to really celebrate, he was kin with us in the like manner as we come into the earth. And when we talk about this, it's important to put this in proper perspective. If, and I say if, he fulfilled all of the things that he fulfilled, and he did. And the kinsman redeemer tells the story of perfect fulfillment in a type, Christ being the actual means, the value. If you want to talk about something, you write a check, but Christ being the substance behind that piece of paper that makes good the promissory note, that which says reconciliation, restoration is possible. Now, of course, we can talk about the means, the shedding of his blood, which had to occur, which is why, by the way, I sung the song, Redeemed. I am redeemed. I'm, re I'm redeemed by the blood that came at a price. It didn't come at the price of a woman giving birth to a child. It came at the price of that child growing into a man and laying down his life, dying in open shame, being buried in a known tomb, coming out of that tomb, showing himself to his disciples and the proclamation he is risen, not to a band of lunatics, but to a band of people who would go out and tell exactly what this good news, the gospel message is, that we are no longer bound by death as we knew before, reconciled to him and all of his promises of life eternal, summed up in the one thing that he made very apparent to the eyes that could see. Death had no more dominion over the body. That in fact, his promise, and multiple times over, the promise of life eternal, the promise of being a son or a daughter, made good in the embodiment of this one we call our kinsman redeemer. This is why you need this whole book. You can't just read one book. Somebody says, what book should I start reading? Well, start by reading something, but eventually make your way around. Don't read it through like you're reading a novel, but read it through eventually to understand you need this whole book. The Old Testament will show you things about what God was wanting to reveal through his word that he ultimately revealed through the word. And this beautiful passage tells me one thing. I don't have to think anymore about how I will make it with him. He hasn't asked me to walk perfectly. If you're listening to me today, and I guarantee you I'm going to speak to 99% of the honest people listening to me who have failed at least one time in your life, whether it's through divorce, whether it's through friendship, family, job, most importantly with God, the story of the kinsman redeemer is he has not changed. And the beautiful picture is we can look at cards and we can look at as we drive on our way today and see major scenes, but one thing I want you to look beyond that is the eternal person who deigned to condescend and bend down low. The thing he, by the way, didn't do for fallen angel, he did for fallen man, knowing our frame that we would always have the potential, and most certainly through our lifetime, even as believers, fall down with the need to be restored over and over and over again. Listen to the rest of what, if you, if you want to take this now and make this your own. Back in John's Gospel, it's amazing that I didn't, I didn't stray too far from this because I thought, I thought I would leave you turning pages today, but 
I left you with your Bible open at John because that's where I'm going to finish. Verses 11, 12, and 13 of the first chapter of John. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him. I wonder, put that in the modern frame. The people that say, I don't, I don't need church. I don't need the Bible. I don't need God. And I told you, sift it down to two types of people. Makes me sad because I was part of that group of people, even though I said I knew God, I was part of that group of people that said I don't need, when the fact of the matter is I needed it more than anybody else, or just as much. He came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that faith that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And just as that child that people celebrate today, born in a manger, I say to you, like a child being born into the poverty, the spiritual poverty of the world. The celebration should be not of trees and presents. I told you, celebrate your loved ones. Use every excuse you can to tell somebody you love them. There's nothing wrong with that. For goodness sakes, just don't use one day of the year. You've got to wait 364 more days to hear somebody say, I love you. You've got a problem. But think of it this way, that the truest meaning and message of this Christmas, whenever the birth of Christ is, is that he loved fallen, that's you and me, enough to condescend and to take on our likeness, to be kin with us, that we might be with him. I cannot think of anything more moving, anything more earth-shaking or staggering than the one eternal of the three of the Godhead taking on my form and your form for just one purpose, to be my kinsman, your kinsman redeemer, that I might be with him, and that as I say his name, Emmanuel, he most certainly is the with us God, kin to you and kin to me, not just in one day, but for eternity. And I pray, especially for those people who came in looking for dreaming of a white Christmas or balls hanging somewhere <laughs> that you leave <laughs> that you leave see I sometimes open my mouth I have no idea what's going but you leave here knowing the love of God not because you feel it but because you can read it in his book and know he gave you the power to become the sons and daughters of God born of him because of what he did which is being memorialized this day as Christmas. I pray you take something with you today that says, thank God I am redeemed. I have a great kinsman redeemer. That's my message, folks. Come on up. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.